All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Barbara Bendlin, and I'm a professor of medicine, and I lead the research education component of the Wisconsin ADRC. And I'll be your host for the ninth annual Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center's Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias Research Day 2023. So um, this event is designed to encourage collaboration and promote scientific thought among faculty, students, researchers, and everyone who's joining us today from a wide range of disciplines across the UW-Madison campus and beyond. So I hope you will enjoy today's uh, engaging lineup um, and that you'll also meet new people and that your research efforts will be uh, inspired and ultimately, um, you know, that we join together to improve the lives of people affected by dementia. So I'd like to thank everyone who has helped make this event possible. And I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the Alzheimer's Association, who's partnering with us today for the AAIC Neuroscience uh, Next Conference. And we also have some special external guests who you'll meet uh, a little bit later this morning. So I'd now like to welcome Dean Golden to provide some opening remarks. Good morning. Today, I am filled with hope. I hope that this is the last snowstorm of the academic year. And I hope that today marks another important incremental step in our battle against the horribly vicious and deadly enemy known as Alzheimer's disease. Now, my first area of hope is kind of inevitable, I think, at least until Thursday. It typically snows again on Thursdays. Uh, and quite frankly, there isn't that much we can do about it. But for the second, much more important area of hope, uh, it is not inevitable. It will require the ongoing dedication of all of you as we explore all possible avenues from the laboratory to the clinic to the community, as we continue to recruit and support the best and the brightest scientists and continue to form important partnerships with communities across the state and nation, especially those where there are disparities, especially those who have been underrepresented in science, clinical research and access to clinical care. So it is inevitable that if we continue to all row in the same direction, we will make progress against this horrible enemy. Now, what do I mean by horrible enemy? I don't have to tell you the statistics, although I will briefly, but is there anyone in this room whose life has not been affected by Alzheimer's disease, either directly or through a family member, loved one or neighbor? I know certainly my family has been touched by it. And my family is not unique. Alzheimer's disease is the seventh leading cause of death with more than 6 million Americans afflicted with this scourge. Here in Wisconsin, 120,000 plus people are living with Alzheimer's or related dementias. More than 11 million Americans provide unpaid care for their loved ones, for their family members. And the paid costs for caring for people with Alzheimer's is estimated to be at least $321 million. But beyond the financial cost is the cost of lost lives, oftentimes lost people prematurely to their actual mortality. And that's why we are committed to doing all that we can to give you the ammunition the support, the equipment, and the materials that you need to continue God's work that you're doing every day. It takes, like so many important things, a community. It takes interdisciplinarity. It takes bringing together patients and their families with scientists and doctors and other healthcare providers. And that's why today's program every year fills me with hope. So on behalf of all the patients and their families and the people of Wisconsin, the nation and the global village, thank you so much for what you're doing on Wisconsin. Thanks.
Thank you, uh, Dean Golden. So now I have the uh, wonderful pleasure of introducing our first uh, featured speaker, uh, Dr. Henrik Zetterberg. So Professor uh, Henrik Zetterberg is a professor of neurochemistry at the University of Gothenburg, uh, Sweden, as well as a clinical chemist at Salgrenska University Hospital in Sweden. Uh, he is also the uh, head of the Department of Psychiatry and Neurochemistry at the University of Gothenburg. Uh, additionally, he leads the UK Dementia Research Institute Fla Fluid Biomarker Laboratory at UCL, and he also directs a laboratory, uh, Fluid Biomarker Laboratory at Hong Kong Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases, and most recently he's joined us as a visiting professor in the UW Department of Medicine here at the School of Medicine and Public Health. So he's made numerous seminal contributions to our field in the development of fluid biomarkers for neurological disorders. A little known fact, he also leads a zebrafish laboratory uh, studying the biology of amyloid precursor protein. Uh, he publishes approximately 300 papers per year and he's, I think, closing in on 2000 total publications uh, to the point where some I think institutions that track these kinds of numbers are becoming suspicious. <laughs> However, um, as everyone knows who has worked with Henrik, he absolutely reads every single paper uh, and provides substantial input. He's just super highly collaborative and um, such a wonderful colleague and friend of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So we're very pleased to welcome you this morning. Thanks a lot. Oh, let's see. Yes. There were um, many long words for you to say this morning, Barb, with the, with, um, uh, the introductions of the, the name of the day and the labs. And so I am very happy to be here. Uh, and uh, also, I would like to tell that uh, all the publications are really not, I mean, it's thanks to all the collaborations that we are having, not the least with University of Wisconsin. So that's and the team here. Uh, we started to collaborate uh, uh, when I was working in University of Gothenburg. I was at an AIC meeting, and then Cindy Carlson came in in, um, in the stairways of the conference, and then uh, she, somehow we started to discuss, and, and you started to speak Swedish to me, and then you said that you were leading a um, clinic collecting cerebrospinal fluid, and that she had a lot of cerebrospinal fluid that we were, that she wondered if we could start measuring things on. And that's how it all started. I will talk about fluid-based biomarkers for amyloid pathology, tau pathology, neurodegeneration, glial activation, synaptic pathology, synuclein pathology, and TDP43 pathology. You see, this will never work in 25 minutes, but let's, let's go. We'll start with amyloid, and this is the easiest marker. Uh, you know that it's really uh, a question about... Um, Now, let's see. Oh. Yeah. Um, 42 amino acid long beta amyloid, we all make it. The, the trick is that we make it and keep it in solution. So neurons produce a lot of a beta 42, the 42 amino acid sticky form, which then in Alzheimer's disease start to deposit in the brain tissue forming plaques. Um, this happens around 15 to 20 years before you get demented from the disease. And there are so many publications showing that if you take a lumbar CSF sample and measure 42 amino acid long beta amyloid, the concentration is approximately half of the normal concentration because amyloid sort of disappears into the tissue and builds up these growing plaques on the brain. And this, most studies have shown this over many, many years. And then we also know if we here if it's moving there if we uh, look at uh, csf beta 42 alone there will be some uh, patients that have low levels because of neuroinflammation neurovascular changes or csf dynamics disturbances like normal pressure hydrocephalus but if we take a ratio between 42 and 40 amino acid long beta amyloid we get an almost perfect amyloid plaque pathology marker 
uh, because in the CSF dynamics disturbances and neuroinflammation and cerebrovascular disease, there is a general reduction of all soluble AP, A beta forms and also APP. But in Alzheimer's, there is a selective reduction of A beta 42. So this is where we can actually make this type of ratio, uh, giving an almost complete concordance of CSF A beta 42 40 with amyloid PET. So if you're designing clinical trials or if you want to prescribe new anti-amyloid drugs, then you can actually, depending on where you work, use either amyloid PET or CSFA beta 4240 if you want to diagnose amyloid. But of course, CSFA beta 4240 will never give any information on anat the anatomy of the or distribution of the plaque pathology, which amyloid PET will. Um, if we use CSFA beta 42 in clinical practice, then you will see that even if you take all samples that come into your lab and measure this ratio, you get a striking, and I think it's amazing, a striking bimodal distribution. Here you see what it looks like when we did a validation study of the Lumen Pulse A beta 42 40 test, which now also is FDA approved. And this is what it looks like if we take out all of the data we generated during three years, we get this type of bimodal distribution. And I think this is fascinating because there is, no, to me, no other explanation. This, this is from almost 13,000 patients who have depression or Alzheimer's or vascular dementia, or, and we still get this bimodal distribution. So to me, this indicates that you age either with or without amyloid pathology. You are either an amyloid depositor or a, a, a person who keeps a beta in solution. And we know also from longitudinal studies, not the least in collaboration with you guys, that all young people are not depositing amyloid. They keep the A beta in solution and the ratio is normal. And then one day it drops and it happens relatively quickly. It's almost like you wake up one day and have a low ratio and then amyloid starts to grow in the brain. Um, we, we have been able to look at this in the RAP study uh, from here. And this is, uh, these are the slides I took from Toby when he presented 2021 at the, the AISC meeting. But I really like this, these two slides. So here you see uh, people who are in the RAP study. They are cognitively normal, but they have one family member or, or more with sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And then to the left, you see their CSFA beta 42 40 ratios. And you see between 40 and 50, there is no one with a low ratio in this study, but from the age of 50, you see that people are dropping in the ratio, indicating that they have then started to accumulate a beta in the brain. And then a few years later, amyloid PET becomes positive, and then the amyloid PET signal grows in a very parallel manner, which to me indicates also that once you have started to deposit amyloid, it's a chemical process in a brain matrix, which is very similar between us. And you can't do much to your growing amyloid by lifestyle. But of course, the way the brain handles the amyloid, then that could, of course, be lifestyle related. And potentially, the onset of the aggregation could be related to lifestyle. Although the studies I've seen the most indicate that the PoE epsilon 4 is, of course, the strongest determinant for onset of amyloid. So if you look at a beta 42 40 ratio together with an APOE epsilon 4, uh, information, then you will know that a positive person who is a PoE4 positive has most likely had the amyloid 10 or even 15 years longer than a, one, a person who is amyloid, APOE4 negative. We, we can measure uh, this in blood also. Let's see if we get a slide on that. There we go. But that, that has not been working well over the years. We thought we were able to measure plasma beta for many years. But if we tested the assays, they didn't perform well. They had poor dilution linearity. Spike recovery was not good. If we spiked in known amounts of beta amyloid into a plasma matrix, we could just recover 30, 40% of it. Uh, but then in 2017, we started to get maspic-based assays for E beta in, in blood. Uh, so this is a study from Randy Bateman's team where he took, uh, let's see if it comes, he took anti-amyloid antibodies in his team and extracted all beta-amyloid from the sample. And then um, the, the uh, eluted A-beta was digested with an enzyme. And then you could also get the A-beta 40 ratio from plasma. This is what it looks like, exactly. 
Um, then the year after, there was another mass spec based assay using an inverted ratio, uh, basically showing the same thing here. So an increase in, with the, the Australian Japanese collaboration study to the right and a decrease to the left. And it looks very similar to, to what we see in CSF. But if you look at the y axis, the percentage reduction of plasma beta 4240 in amyloid PET positive people is only 10, 12 percent. So it's a very small change. And from a if you work in a clinical lab, it's really difficult to maintain such an assay stable enough week by week in a clinical lab service without having small drifts in the assay that escape the internal control um, uh, data um, so that you can make a lot of people cross the threshold for positivity since it's so tight. Uh, the CSFA beta for the 240 reduction is much more clear, so that works in clinical practice, but this, this is much more uh, questionable. We have also made, together with Roche, an Alexis assay for a beta 4240. And this is a very honest graph showing the problem with the assay. So the, you see, to the left, you see a amyloid negative people, and to the right, you see amyloid positive people. And you see this type of reduction in amyloid pet positive people. Again, 10, 12%. The AUCs become relatively good of around 0.8, but the overlap and the scatter of individual data points make this not a good clinical chemistry test for individual diagnostics. Uh, so I think that is where we stand now with the plasma e beta 4240 ratio. It's very interesting in research studies, but in clinical chemistry practice, it is not a robust marker. So there we go. This slide just underscores the problem. So if you look in the middle of this graph, you see a beta 42 and 40 data on the y and x axis in amyloid PET positive and negative people, and you get two relatively distinct populations. And the, the um, dashed line indicates the, the cut points for the differentiation. And you can see that there you can actually have some type, some small bias in, in, in the assay without getting a big problem with misclassified patients. But if you look to the left, the plus maybe tough to do for the ratio, then you see that there is a group level discrimination, but it's super tight. So if your assay is the slightest off, then you will mislabel a lot of people. We think that this test is, works for enrichment when you do a, a clinical trial, or if you want to examine a group of individuals in regards to how, how likely they are to deposit amyloid, but it's not good in clinical practice. Um, C2M here in the US and some other labs are trying to use a beta 4240 together with information on APOE e, uh, phenotype, I should say. They measure the APOE e isoforms of the, the, um, uh, that represents the APOE e epsilon 4 um, together with age. But to me, that's a little bit cheating because then you are incorporating information which is not at all biomarker related because you're born with your, your APOE e genotype. And you get older, no matter what you, <laughs> or if you build up amyloid or not. So with the years, all of us get more likely to have amyloid in, in the brain. And that's really not a biomarker, I think. Now, if we move to tau, uh, we know that CSF phosphotau is increased in, in Alzheimer's disease. And that has been known also for a long time. It was interpreted in the beginning as reflecting tangle pathology. But we also know that if you look in primary tau passes, this is a very old study from Japan, where you see all semi disease patients to the left having clearly elevated total tau and phosphotau levels in cerebrospinal fluid. But in this graph, there are also groups representing primary tau pathies, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal degeneration, and such diseases. And there, the tau markers in the biofluids do not work. And this, we, I think we have not thought carefully about that for many years, but now it's relatively clear that the mechanism through which tau in cerebrospinal fluid and blood gets increased is that this is an amyloid effect on neurons. So neurons that are close to amyloid pathology will start to phosphorylate and secrete tau. And that's an active process for neurons that are still alive. And I actually think that this is a pruning effect. This is something that the amyloid does normally. For example, in the developing brain, where you actively prune your synaptic networks, it looks like beta amyloid in small oligomers together with complement can help microglia to prune synapses. And when a synapses, synapse is pruned, then you also get a signal to kinases that phosphorylate tau, so that tau lets go of the microtubuli in the axons, so the axons can be, can be retracted in a physiological manner. 
And then this effect gives you a lot of free-floating tau inside the axon that is phosphorylated, and then it's transported towards the neuronal soma, where it's supposed to undergo lysosomal degradation. It can also form loose tangle-like structures that are not, um, but they are not insoluble like in Alzheimer's. And then if the, in parallel, there is also an active secretion of phosphorylated tau. And this involves a cleavage of tau, so that the secreted tau is also more N-terminal, it's not full-length tau. And the C-terminal part of tau most likely goes for lysosomal degradation. And if this is system is overloaded, then you get tangle pathology over the years. So what I've said now is that the phosphor tau and also total tau markers are more amyloid markers when you measure them in biofluids. Um, one could rephrase this also and say that these markers are markers of tau pathophysiology in Alzheimer's disease of amyloid-related tau pathophysiology. And neurons who do this are, of course, ill from Alzheimer's disease, and they will eventually develop tangles and degenerate and die. So the phosphotau markers could also be predictive markers of tangle pathology, which explains why you, in the late stages of the disease, start to get correlations with tau pit, for example. So that is the, perhaps I talked too much about this and showed too few slides, but if you get a, a popular question in the fluid biomarker world is which phosphotau form should you measure? And then my advice to you, if you get this question, is to say, I don't really care about the specific phosphor tau form. They are relatively similar. I care about N-terminal versus C-terminal tau. That's where the difference is. Uh, okay, uh, uh, perhaps I should explain this more, but I don't. Uh, uh, we can talk about that later today. Um, so there are a lot of phosphor forms in, in cerebrospinal fluid, and they show a very similar pattern. Uh, so uh, I won't go into details here. I think the tau phosphorylation site is not that important. It's more related to what is easy and not to measure. Um, there are then different phosphor forms that also can measures, be measured in, in blood. And then it looks like phosphor tau 231 with the phosphorylation at the 231st amino acid is a little bit earlier and then it plateaus, whereas phosphor tau 217 increases early, but then has a stepwise increase, the more advanced Alzheimer's disease gets. This is, it looks a little bit like that, but I don't think it's a very important pattern. So I, I would advise you to choose, um, either we, we can in studies do all of the phosphor tau markers, continue to study this, or in, in the practice one should choose a phosphor tau form with a robust assay. That is the most important thing. Um, but in in the in um, the rap cohort, then it's uh, clear that phosphatau 217 with the assays we have at hand is the marker that often gives you the most interesting information. So I think phosphatau 217 is probably the marker we should choose if we at the moment if we need to pick one. That could be for cost reasons or so. Um, you can actually make this type of um, algorithms where you where you include information on phosphor tau 217 or 181 together with simple memory tests. And then you can give, give a quite good um, prediction on whether a person with subjective cognitive impairment or mild cognitive impairment four years later will have Alzheimer's disease dementia. And the AUC is often 0.9, so it's, an, it's a good predictive value. And then this marker, these uh, phosphor tau markers, they also work to detect the effect of the anti-amyloid antibodies. And that is, of course, very exciting. So this is aducanumab data showing around 20% reduction in phosphor tau 181. And then we have lecanumab data showing a very similar result. And then we have donanumab data showing also, see if that works, let's see. There. Donanumab data showing also a, a very similar reduction. There is, if I, I will say one more, thing. I, then I will wrap up quickly here. Um, you, there is something. I mean, all, the whole field has been very um, excited about the phosphor tau changes in response to the anti-amyloid antibodies, but the fold increase of phosphor tau in blood is two to three fold when you get amyloid, and here we see twenty percent reductions. And then when you think about this, it's a little bit daunting when you start to think about explanations, because there are several explanations that we don't, we don't know which one is correct here. Either this means that the anti-amyloid antibodies diminish the toxic effect of amyloid directly or indirectly via astrocytes and microglia on the neurons, and the levels of phosphor tau drop a little bit. 
But then also, this floor effect is also very commonly seen. That's one potential explanation that, that one would have to treat even more, even though the patients become amyloid PET negative, they might have some oligomers of beta amyloid still affecting the neurons. It could also mean that phosphotau actually can reflect a tau pathophysiology, which might be triggered by amyloid, but then independent of amyloid. And that's a little bit of the, this is the daunting explanation, uh, potential interpretation of these results, because then it means that we have to develop a tau targeting treatment as well if the patient has both amyloid and tau pathophysiology. Uh, so uh, we will see what this, what, what the longer follow up uh, data on this indicate. So uh, for phosphor tau, we have uh, the possibility of doing group level enrichment in regards to tau pathophysiology, and the two to three fold change in response to amyloid also makes it, these markers good potential tests for diagnostic use in clinical practice, and that is what we will see happen. Now many labs will start to do this. For neurodegeneration, here I will be super quick, quick. We have neurofilament light. It's increased across neurodegenerative diseases like this. And it responds to treatment in multiple sclerosis, for example. You can treat patients with natalizumab and make them normal in regards to the NFL levels. And it works in spinal muscular atrophy also, which is a childhood neurodegenerative disease that you can treat effectively with an ASO where NFL levels drop. It didn't work in Huntington with ASO-mediated silencing of Huntington. But instead, actually, you could see with neurofilament light an increase in NFL that was dose dependent and marked the toxic effect of the ASO. So now the company is trying to change this a little bit and make the knockdown more allele specific so that uh, pathological hunting team will be knocked down. You can measure it in blood that we know since a long time. And the dynamics of the traumatic brain injury are similar in blood and CSF after uh, experimental neurotrauma. So we have regarded plasma and CSF NFL levels as very similar biomarkers, but of course, plasma NFL is much more accessible. But we also know, this is a study from Huntington, that the fold change of NFL is greater in CSF than in plasma. So it looks like the CSF test is more sensitive to detect onset of neurodegeneration. And this is important clinically. Because if you do plasma NFL, you can never exclude a neurodegenerative disease. And this was, to, to be able to do that was a dream that we had when we developed the test, that we would have a super simple blood test where one could take the test. If it was negative, you don't have to think about neurodegenerative disease. But that's not how it works. On the other hand, if you in clinical practice find high NFL levels in plasma, plasma then you have to find out why. Because most often there is a, a disease uh, there. This is in familial Alzheimer's disease, where you see how people shoot off in their NFL levels when they approach year of onset. So it's um, a marker of onset of neurodegeneration and intensity of neurodegeneration. But in old people, if we go to an a sporadic Alzheimer's disease cohort, NFL is a noisy marker because it reacts to cerebrovascular changes. It there is a, a, a very irritating age-related increase of NFL. Uh, brain trauma will also give you higher levels and so on. So it's uh, not, uh, not um, an easy market to interpret in older people. And then glial activation, then we have GFAP. I will just show you here. No, it's not. Here, uh, GFAP really increases the response to amyloid, astrocytic activation. Then we have synaptic pathology, SNAP25. Rachel Wilson here has done very interesting studies on this. It also might work in blood. And then we have nuclear pathology, where there is the possibility of using a RT quick based assay to where you can spike in recombinant alpha synuclein and look at seeded aggregation. So you follow with THT onset of aggregation. If you have a lumbar CSF sample from a patient with synuclein pathology, you can look at seeded amplification of alpha synuclein. And then it looks like this that this happens in not in Alzheimer's, but in DLB, in Parkinson, and in, in um, also MSA patients. And this is also our experience when we have tried this test in, in uh, Gothenburg. I think this is a test we will, might consider to set up here in, in Wisconsin as well. TDP43 pathology can also potentially be detected with a similar type of test, but it's much more noisy, as you see in this graph. So more research is needed here. And then there is this type of uh, summary that Inge Verberg did in um, Alzheimer's Association um, 
year in review symposium, and I've taken it straight away from Inge with her permission, that summarizes what, what we need to do more with the plasma biomarkers, and also that we still need to do cerebrospinal fluid research. Because one can get the feeling that now with the new blood biomarkers that work so relatively well, perhaps we should stop collecting CSF. But that is not what we should do, at least, we should do not, at least not in research cohorts, because we need to find new biomarkers for non Alzheimer's neurodegenerative diseases. And that's much easier to do in CSF than in blood. And the new blood tests, how they should be used here. We have also summed this up in an um, appropriate use um, recommendation paper. But I will make sure that you get these types of references to Sharon, and then, then I won't spend time on them. Here's the biomarker team, University of Wisconsin. And uh, then with this, I would like to thank you for the attention. And uh, I don't think, I will see if there, I will be here the whole day if there are questions. Thanks. It's the time for question. I spoke too much. I had too many slides. You did an amazing job. Thank you. And um, we are going to take questions actually at lunchtime for Dr. <laughs> Zetterberg. So um, thank you, Dr. Zetterberg, again, for your support of the center and your collaboration and your direction of the lab. And yes, thank you again.